Essentially, the, the name ClearSight comes from the understanding, basically what I've worked with and what I've been working with over the last, at this stage, just close to 40 years, is the ancient Chinese tradition of literally reading faces. The understanding there is that our static facial features reveal a huge amount of information about our personality, our behavior style, how we communicate, both in terms of how we receive and process information, as well as then how we communicate externally. Uh, stress triggers and responses, health patterns, because I learned that as a diagnostic tool, as part of one of the, the diagnostic tools used in traditional oriental medicine, and a lot more besides. I've also then, over the last God, God knows how many years, done a lot of study with former FBI trainers in the areas of negotiation, interrogation, counter-interrogation, and I've blended all of that together. So the understanding basically behind the name of the, the business clear sight is that so much information is revealed literally in clear sight about who we are through our facial features, expressions, body language, posture, even how we dress can be very revealing. So literally clear, everything available in clear sight. Tell me, how can I become a better negotiator? Okay, there's so many, there's so many aspects to negotiation. And one of the key things that people often neglect, and even at a very high level, is their own self-awareness and self self-management. And I'm talking not just not just there in terms of the, the technicalities of negotiation or the, the intellectual understanding, but their emotional awareness. So many people get caught up in emotion. And they get they can they can either be sucked in by other people's emotion, or uh, or other people's behavior, or they can be triggered. Their own unresolved emotional patterns can be triggered. So learning to be calm is the first step. Learning to learn to be calm and maintain calm. And then there are certain certain basics that are absolutely essential. Number one for me is actually to enter the room always enter the room and that's a, whether that's a virtual room or a, or a physical room with a smile if it's a physical room take your time to come into the room so you convey before you speak you convey an air of confidence and authority uh, if it's a virtual room obviously you're going to meet at the same time but make sure your posture is upright make sure you're looking actually into the camera rather than looking around because I've, I've come across so many people and you would almost get seasick watching them. They're moving so much. So keep your movements relatively still. If possible, and this may sound a little odd given that we're only by and large seeing the, the upper half of the body, make sure your hands are at some stage seen because people, it's, it's, it's hardwired into us to be suspicious if we don't see somebody's hands. So we automatically feel safer and safety is essential. And then the other, the two other big things really for me are making sure we listen and not just listen to the words, but listen to how the person is speaking. Listen for tone of voice, listen for changes in tone of voice, changes in the rhythm of the voice. Um, but to ensure that the person we are speaking with, and that could be a person or it could be a group of people, ensure that they feel listened to. So when they have made a point, made a suggestion, made an offer, check that we have, check with them that we have actually understood, repeat it back to them. Maybe not in exactly the same words, but to a large extent, repeat it back to ensure that they know we have actually understood where they're coming from because misunderstanding arises very common very commonly in negotiation and one other particular thing is to learn to stop speaking learn to use silence as a tool many people are very uncomfortable fearful about silence and if we can learn to be comfortable with it our counterpart will often reveal information that they hadn't originally intended to. So there are a few very basic and to me essential, essential requirements in being successful as a negotiator. They're very interesting thoughts, Joseph, because 
um, I realize at times that when people become stressed, the pitch of their voice increases. That's one thing. And they also speak faster. I can really see their chest, their hearts pounding in their chests because they're tensed up. If on the other hand, somebody is slowing down, they're buying time to think for themselves and to see how you react also when they say something to you. So there's a load of signals out there. And I do remember in one negotiation I was involved in myself, the person who was negotiating with me on behalf of our employer, they used silence as a negotiation tactic. I learned from that actual experience. What in the world is a homogenous experience? Why is life not a series of homogenous experiences? Wow, that's another another deep one. Um, yeah, we when we when we interact with other people, um, and obviously we haven't been physically interacting with so many other people um, in in the last couple of years. But even even meeting people online, if we're in a if we're in a group situation, for example, we're in a Zoom room. We're, uh, team meeting, whatever whatever the medium is, whatever the platform is, we'll see a variety of different people there, different faces, different backgrounds, different styles of dress, uh, different mannerisms, um, or, we, or we're, when we're out and about and we're meeting people socially, we're meeting people from such a variety of backgrounds, and particularly now where it's multicultural as well. So the idea, the idea that when we communicate that we should have a, a one-size-fits-all just doesn't make sense. Um, we need to we need to be adaptable in our behaviour, in our responses, in our in our, our capacity to engage with other people. Because we need to be able to meet them if we want successful relationships in life in business. We need to be able to meet other people where they are at. We have a tendency to see the world through our own prism, and to think that other people see things as we do, which is very, very rarely the case. There may be similarities of view, but very often we miss actually really understanding where the other person is coming from. So if we are, if we, I guess it's train ourselves as much as allow ourselves to be adaptable in our behavior and in our approach, we're much more skilled and much more capable of engaging with people successfully. And as I say, understanding where they are actually coming from, understanding how they need to receive our message, how they, how they process information, rather than us just talking at them. Because a lot of, um, I, I, I frequently use the George Bernard Shaw quote, the greatest illusion about communication is that it has happened, that people, talk doesn't mean they have communicated it just means they have spoken it doesn't mean that they have spoken in a way that whoever they are speaking to has understood or digested or agreed with whatever they have said so if we understand and we can understand we can learn from simply observing people's visuals if we understand somebody else's communication style how they how they best receive and process information we can tailor our style of presentation to their needs. I'm not talking about uh, watering down our values, but just adapting our behavior so that our behavior, again, is not, is not homogenous. It's not just this, this is how I am, this is how I behave, and, this is, and I don't change for anybody, which just diminishes us, diminishes our capacity to build relationship and ultimately inhibits our capacity to be successful. That's a great answer. And thank you for that. And I do remember when I moved to England in the very late 80s, it was only about 24 or 5 at the time. And I was working in this company out in southeast London. And one day I said to my boss, I said, um, I noticed the people around here, they spend more time shouting at each other. And his reply was, John, that's all they know. And as long as you re remain here, that's all you will know. And I said, wow. <laughs> You know, so he was very much the sort of person who was in your face the whole time. And I couldn't cope with that. I think he could have modified his communication style to suit me uh, more. And I could have been a bit more upfront with him also, or, or a bit more direct at times. So lesson hard learned. And I think um, 
if he was to reflect on that experience, he probably would say to himself, he had quite a, a large say in a very unhappy experience for me as a young professional person at the time. But there you go. Why is curiosity an important aspect in the business environment? Curiosity is essential. Um, it enables us. It enables us to learn. And I actually just put a post up on LinkedIn this morning about curiosity. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a lot of research to show that when we allow ourselves to be curious, and I mean genuinely curious, not fake curiosity, when we allow ourselves to be curious, it triggers a capacity to um, not just to learn, but to retain what we have learned. It also triggers a capacity, it, it, it triggers a, the more, a more creative response within our brain. It creates a willingness to learn. And if we're willing to learn, if we're willing to explore, if we're willing to step out of our own fixed ideas as to this is what I want, or this is how it is, and this is only what I want, and I'm, I'm only going to settle for this. Um, if we're willing to be curious, to, particularly when it comes to negotiation and communication, if we're willing to be curious um, about where somebody else is coming from and their perspective and their position and their understanding, um, and we're willing to ask quest open questions, A, they feel respected, which means they're more likely to be open and more responsive to us, but also we're going to learn more. And we may learn something of immense value to us rather than, rather than adopting this, again, this kind of fixed position of I'm only here for this. Um, and it's, it's, it's a way of, it's a way of, to me, creating a more, a far greater chance for chance of winning, of gaining something. And it may not be that that particular interaction is necessarily successful, but it at least plants the seeds for something else to develop because so often like if we if we if we look at the opposite of curiosity they're just being closed um we've i'm sure we've all seen examples of that in our lives in <clears throat> in our professional and our personal lives where arguments like you've just spoken about people shouting at each other in a work environment and when people misunderstand and miscommunicate it creates tension but it's one of the most basic human needs to feel heard. And if somebody feels, and I mean feels, if they feel they have been listened to, even if we don't agree with each other, automatically there's a degree of respect and there's the capacity to build something from that. But it's, it's the lack of curiosity that stifles so much communication and so many potential, so many possibilities for successful negotiation. Thank you for that answer, Joseph. And it's a very good answer because I think what I've learned from negotiation over the years is sometimes people can be guarded, particularly in the business environment, mm -hmm. when they enter a negotiation process and they're not willing to put their cards on the table or to explain the real motive. So the other person at the far side of the table, they have to keep asking questions of that person to get them to unveil their true reasons for having this negotiation process and why they're looking, for example, for savings uh, in a contract situation. What is wrong with people? Why do we tend to, to treat some people differently than others? Oh, <laughs> oh we're all prone to bias, John. Uh, for so many reasons. And if you look at the, the work of uh, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, they've identified something like 200 different forms of bias that people can be prone to. Uh, and that, I know that's been, that work has been also replicated in by, <clears throat> by psychologists. So um, we all have our biases. And when we meet other, other people, whether it's in some cases people we know well, or it could be new people, they can trigger some reaction in us and it could be that we were brought up with a with a particular bias against a particular type of person um, a particular race um, so many so many variations there and biases can become embedded in how we see the world so again that brings me back to curiosity um, a willingness to be curious rather than and it's it's taking that well, for me, when, when I find that coming up, 
and it does it, I'm human so it occurs it certainly occurs in my case when it comes up I'm more and more able and willing to just as it were take a step back and say okay yeah that's triggering something but it may not have to do anything to do with this person here so it's a it's a willingness to then be curious about this person I'm meeting or this group of people I'm meeting and um, to again just be willing to learn something from the from the engagement rather than rather than again reacting and it is often reacting from this often unconscious uh, triggered response which again can be so so limiting I don't know if that quite answers the question but it's the best I can do for the moment. That's fine, yeah. You mentioned at the outset of the interview that you worked with uh, or you learned from people who were FBI trainers in the past in terms of mm-hmm. negotiation. What did you learn as a person about yourself having met those people? Oh, uh, I learned that I had a lot more to learn. That's one of the things um, I realised. And it's one of the blessings, I suppose. It's It's very humbling to meet somebody who knows far, far more than you do, no matter where you are in your life. Um, And to, and it's very gratifying when they are willing to share their knowledge, their experience and their understanding. So it was, um, it was a lesson in gratitude and appreciation. First of all, it was a lesson in realizing that there's no limit to gratitude and appreciation. So there's always more we can give. Um, there's always more we can learn. And to recognize that in some ways I had probably limited myself. Again, my, I had my own blinkers on in ways. So I was I was limiting myself and thinking, oh, I, this is how I want to do things. This is how I'm going to make things work, rather than being willing to be as adaptable as I needed to be. Um, and it also triggered a joy, a joy in learning, <clears throat> a joy, <clears throat> excuse me, a joy, <clears throat> a joy in engaging with people who really had gone into their subject in depth and not just understood it up here, but were actually living it because that's, um, that's, that's, that for me is, is part of the magic when somebody's really living what they're talking about and really, and you can see it in their enthusiasm, their willingness to share. And they're not, and it's not, um, it's, it's not, a like some people when they know something and they know more than you, that they can be very arrogant about it and they can either withhold it or they can, they can present the information in a way that's almost designed or intended to make you feel smaller. But these people, they had a willingness to share and to, in a way that was, was, was designed to open your eyes, to show you more, to bring, bring out more from within you, more of your own capability. And to see that, to see that being demonstrated um, is another, for, another reminder for me that, again, I, need, I needed to improve my capacity and my willingness to do that, to be more willing, more able to help bring out the best in others, because it is never just a case of sharing information. The information has to have a purpose that is of benefit to the people you're engaging with. That's an amazing answer, Joseph. And when you see some of these programs on Sky TV or RTE, where it's uh, special special forces are you tough enough, um, and you see people, ordinary civilians going into these programs, and then the directing staff slowly but surely, they strip these people back and they identify their weaknesses and then they help them to conquer their fears. And that's most obvious during the uh, negotiation, the capture phase, when they're held prisoner and they're, they have a mask over their face, they have goggles over their eyes, they don't know where they are, there's noises being played into their ears to uh, dis orientate them and to confuse them and they're put into all these difficult positions uh, where they you know get pain in their body it's all designed to break them down and to help them to see 
that they have more strength within themselves than they originally believed. It's actually a very, very interesting type of work. You spent over three decades mastering your observation skills. What can you tell us about communications? And why do some people fail to get their point across succinctly? Okay, uh, it's some, well, there's, there are probably several answers to that. Um, there, there are people who maybe understand things very, very well, but have a, have a, 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 haven't developed the capacity to articulate it, whether, whether that's verbally or on paper. Um, there are many people, as we see nowadays, involved in tech industries who, when they meet non-techies, still speak a very technical language, use acronyms, et cetera, which have no meaning whatever for, for non-techies. So again, the basic point is that if, we're, if we want to communicate successfully, we have to, we have, again, have to develop a willingness and capacity to see other people and meet them where they are at. Basically, what I'm talking about is creating a bridge rather than talking at them or talking across them. And if we have the, for want of a better word, humility um, and openness and vulnerability as well, I guess, to meet other people where they are at, we have far, far greater chance of success in communicating and building relationship and building relationship then beyond, beyond that person with the people they know. Because one of the things I learned very early on in, in, in the area of business networking um, was the whole idea of having other people talk enthusiastically about you when you're not there. So if you communicate effectively and willingly and share something of yourself with other people, they're more willingly, they're more willing to speak highly of you to other people. So it's, if we just if we're just thinking in terms of the person we're speaking with and we're not creating that bridge, we're limiting the capacity for that relationship, but we're also limiting the capacity for relationship developing beyond that. Again, slight, maybe slight deviation from, from the, the, the answer, but or the, the question. I know what you're getting at there is, you often hear this phrase used in networking circles, you have to get to know, like, and trust a person. And I think what you're saying there, Joseph, is that the trust factor is actually the most important, that mm -hmm. if you come across as too uh, perfect in a, in a networking circle, people won't necessarily engage with you. They'll set themselves behind your back. He has some hidden message there. If you make mm -hmm. it vulnerable and say, I'm not so perfect, then people will see the human side in you, and then they're more willing to negotiate with you and to build a business or personal relationship with you. And I think so for me from this interview today, the three things I've taken away is number one, the importance of actively of actively sorry of actually actively listening to people. Also the importance of silence in negotiation. It allows the other person in the negotiation process to reveal more about themselves. And also, Joseph, you mentioned here today, and I think that's very important to myself, is lifelong learning. Yes. That's really crucial in the business world because the, the pace of change is getting faster and faster with each passing year in the business world. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience before I let you go? Yeah, they, well, again, just to just to add on, just add on to that, the lifelong learning thing. Um, so much of what we're doing nowadays involves technology, but we're still dealing with people, and we're always likely to be dealing with people. So it's to remember that fact, even when we're essentially living living online as we have been, because we're going to be doing a lot online like this for the foreseeable future, maybe forever. So we still need to remember the fact that we are dealing with people and we still have to have those, uh, those capac that, that capacity and continue to develop that capacity to relate and connect and communicate. And trust is absolutely essential there to building successful relationship. 
um, just I, I guess in terms of just in terms of people contacting me, I guess which is which is relevant. Probably the best I do have my own website, which is clearsightcommunications.com, but the quickest way is to connect with me is on LinkedIn. And if anybody wants to know more about my programs, which generally are under the, the umbrella of communicate, negotiate and collaborate, whether it's a mastermind or a program for companies, connect with me on LinkedIn and I'd be more than happy to have a discovery call and uh, take it from there. And on that note, I'll bring today's interview to an end. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, John. Absolute pleasure.